Joining us today, Akshita Bhanj Dio. She is part of the leadership team at Giving Pie, an initiative at Dasra, creating social impact. She's a young leader, barely in her 30s, not even. Uh, and she uh, has a litany of credits to her name. She's a Davis Scholar, a Net Zero Fellow. Uh, she studied at Bard uh, Political Sciences, Human Rights. Uh, she moved back to India to pursue her work in terms of development, giving back, youth empowerment, social initi initiatives, and really creating a powerful ecosystem. She is also a descendant of the Mayurbhanj royal family, uh, which is uh, you know, descendant and has its family home in Orissa. And uh, she has been part of renovating the family home in Belgaria along with her family. And it's actually been uh, recognized as one of the 100 most beautiful places to visit by Time magazine. Akshita, congratulations <laughs> on you. that Thank and you. all the wonderful things that you do. So we've got to get into each of these things one by one yes. and uh, you know, really get an insight into your journey. So, so first, take us towards um, you know, your experience in terms of what you chose to study, what you wanted to do, was there always a plan, uh, and how you sort of came back to India to pursue social impact. Definitely. I think everything, one, thank you so much for having me here today and, and speaking so eloquently about all my work. It sounds uh, a lot more glamorous than it is. I think like each of those milestones took a village to actually get me there. So a lot of it, I hope today is about exploring the communities I belong to and, and the wonderful work they're doing. Uh, but to answer your question, I think I was, you know, I was born and raised in the east of India between Bengal and Orissa. Mm -hmm. So uh, Calcutta had a family home just because of the, you know, past sure. connections to being the British capital. Uh, post that I went from my boarding school to Singapore to United World Colleges mm -hmm. and from there for Bard College for New York okay. uh, to my higher studies. So it was quite a journey to get this like multicultural and multilingual education mm -hmm. and kind of I think it seeded a lot of cosmopolitan ideas about how the world was changing. Um, but I think right after college I got into, my first job was actually with David Miliband who was yeah. a former Foreign Secretary of the UK and I got into the International Rescue Committee working on uh, you know, communications regarding Syrian refugees, mm. access to uh, countries in the West. And I think that's, that was really powerful. Um, my job as an associate right out of college was I had to listen to refugees in host countries yeah. and uh, note down their stories to be able to tell media mm. to galvanize uh, some kind of lobbying movement for letting refugees actually enter sure. other countries. And I think that kind of spurred off, uh, I think in my head I always knew I wanted to get into international affairs, but I realized that communications can be a powerful tool. So I've, I feel like I've replicated that in every other organization that I work with, how to build powerful campaigns to change people's hearts and minds nice. towards issues that really matter today. So uh, the, I don't think my parents really had a, had a plan for me. I think they were, they were quite... Uh, progressive with their views in terms of three daughters and you know uh, we can we could really do all we wanted to do uh, but I was lucky that uh, after having traveled the world at the age of you know reaching 25 I me and my sister both realized that what we really wanted to do was go back to our roots restore our ancestral home mm -hmm. and have it become a vehicle for sustainable development and I think social enterprise was such a buzzword back then it yeah. still is now but we realized that maybe it's via tourism, we can kind of build uh, local experiences mm -hmm. and kind of shine a light on areas we really wanted to. So, uh, you know, 15 years ago, Mayurubhanj was one of the poorest districts in India. Mm -hmm. So last year when Time Magazine gave us this, you know, organic shout out of being one of the 100 greatest places in the world to visit, uh, for us it was like a milestone moment because we felt oh. like how you can sometimes leave legacies of stories. So I do believe in the power of stories and ideas and communities to actually change hearts and minds. And I want to hear more about Belgaria actually, <laughs> but uh, tell me what life was like growing up. Just yeah. to whether to dispel notions of how yeah. uh, princesses yes, grow up yes, or whether yes. to, to maybe connect yes. us to some of that culture and history. Definitely. Disney's done a bad one yeah. for us. <laughs> um, it, uh, it's not always as, as that glamorous. But I think that growing up in one of these families, to be honest, I was lucky to... Uh, I went for holidays to a lot of historical homes, a lot of properties that were in different sometimes states of disrepair, but mm -hmm. they had this beauty of, you know, um, kind of, uh, not just a bygone era, but just a lot of artisans and, and you know, uh, culture and, and folk and traditional arts and crafts. I think when you grow up in the Eastern Bengal, it's very much about uh, this quintessential uh, Eastern idea, which is, you know, you should be extremely cultured. Mm -hmm. So we grew up with a lot of like, I studied Bharatanatyam for close to 10 years. We played the 
harmonium, which I think like if I mention that to most people, I don't know if they have like that, that's, that, that is kind of an accomplishment being funded for a couple of years. But you know, singing, music, dance, all of that is part of it. Sure. Um, and like I said, I think traveling, a lot of my friends travel to like a lot of world capitals mm -hmm. and we travel to capitals most people may not have heard of. Right. Whether that was, you know, Muradabad or Selana mm -hmm. or, you know, places in India which were at one point, uh, you know, capitals of different princely states and, and now may not be towns that you know of but have really held a lot of uh, mystique and, you know, have been significant in India's history at least. Sure. And I think that uh, bred in us a lot of, uh, you know, homegrown love for uh, being vocal for local, mm -hmm. for understanding artisans and craftsmanship and uh, kind of what makes India, India. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I read a note um, yeah. about how you said you come from an ancestry that was always about empowerment. Yes. And uh, how even before it became a thing, it was really about equal opportunity. And I found that yeah. so interesting because yeah. you're talking about ancestry and, and female ancestry yeah. in, in the royal times where you would assume yes. it would be exactly the opposite. Yeah, I feel very, uh, I feel very strongly about that mm -hmm. because I think a lot of history would be written by men yeah. or focuses on male's achievement. And I think even when we speak about royal families and you kind of think of Gayatri Devi, and I love it because she was a princess of the East yes. and she was educated and she was progressive and she knew how to speak to global media and global faces and that's kind of what you, you also know most about her because she's the most written about and photographed yeah. uh, at a time when women weren't allowed to be photographed and we were definitely not giving you know exclusives to foreign press sure. but she had an understanding of what the world was going to be mm. like and how her you know how she wanted to be viewed in that world. Yeah. Um, but apart from that, that doesn't mean that history hasn't had so many female leaders, accomplished administrators, you know, whether they were army generals to um, the fact that uh, they had kind of raised, uh, you know, men who went on to lead India. So I think that um, something I like to mention in my Urupanch is a lot of actually uh, royal families had both matrilineal and patrilineal lines. It's just that since the British came, they came with their archaic, you know, sort of Edwardian uh, views on how society functioned, for which we're still suffering today for a lot of draconian laws. Um, but uh, in Mayurbhanj, there was a family called the Bhomakara dynasty, which was a Buddhist uh, mm -hmm. dynasty. And, you know, we never learned that as much in school. So uh, it was, it's interesting because they were female leaders and uh, there was a matrilineal line followed, which actually some royal families still follow today right. in the south or the northeast, etc. And uh, the doctrine of laps was a big reason for male heirs being, you know, chosen or, and, you know, uh, a lot of that bred into kind of ideas of stereotypes of who could be leaders. Um, but in my family, my last name means, it's Bhanja, okay. which means Bhongo, which is to break. So it kind of means, some, you know, like breakers off. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really interesting because <laughs> when you think of royal families, there wasn't actually a divine right. The nobility was actually people who either stood yeah. up for something or for someone. And that's where allegiance grew. And Got I think it. that uh, I, I, I took that from uh, history, right? Like you that's can amazing. always stand yeah. up for something and someone and everyone has the ability to do that. It's not one family's or one person's divine right. Mm -hmm. And actually my uncle would tell me this. He said, we're all descendants of princes and paupers. You just decide which fate you want to choose. Uh, so I do think there were many stories of, uh, you know, uh, empowerment and whether that was, you know, Mayurbhanj was one of the last princely states to join India because mm -hmm. it was a constitutional monarchy from before. The, uh, the fact that they believe in a Senate system. So each, we have over 30 different kinds of indigenous tribes in Mayurbhanj and each of them had a, uh, a maji or a head who was actually spoken to and spoke for the community. So mm -hmm. everyone came to communal decisions mm -hmm. towards uh, kind of the state's history. So I think that that was really great but yeah. to be honest when I was growing up in India I didn't really know much about my history as much as I should have. I think I mm -hmm. you know I kind of grew up being like okay that's one part of my identity but when I go yeah. to Mayurbhanj or when I travel or that's kind of where it comes out. Um, I had a very interesting anecdote. I went to college to Bard College which is a, a liberal arts yeah. uh, small uh, college in New York and there was a class for politics and I wanted to get into, uh, you had to do electives, so mm. you had to choose sometimes subjects you want, you know, and I chose uh, politics of South Asia. And uh, for some reason I got me in as a freshman and mostly it was a senior advanced political class. And at the end of the class the teacher was like, you know, Akshita so can you stay back? And it was a class of like 10 people, so I was like, oh God, now what did I do? And then uh, I stayed back and he said, he was like looking down the whole time and he said, so where are you from? Mm. And he was from India, he's from Assam. I said, oh, I'm from India. And he's like, where in India? So I was like, oh, I grew up in Calcutta. He's like, you're not from Calcutta. Where are you from? 
And when somebody just says that, I know the angling. So then oh. I'm like, I, you know, I, I'm from Mayurbhanj, for this small town. And if you come from a small town, you have this way of saying it as well. Like, you know, almost as while you're saying it, you're like, you wouldn't know it. Like, right. You know? And uh, he said, he looked up and he said, uh, please give my thanks to the Maharani and Maharaj of Mayurbhanj. So I said, I'm, I'm sorry. And he said, uh, you know, my name is so-and-so. And I grew up in a small part of uh, Shillong. Mm. And at the time, my family didn't have our money for education. Oh, my gosh. And the Maharaj of Mayurbhanj from some distant land called Orissa decided to donate his summer palace to become a school and college. And uh, I got educated in that school because of your grandfather's benevolence. Such so I hope, a small world. And yeah. look at that. That's, yeah. that's amazing. And so he kind of was the one. I wanted to study dance and theater in college. And he was like, you, know, you, really, you really need to understand like, a little bit of your family's history and its importance and how indirectly you may have mm. shaped uh, sure. influences. And, uh, and I became a political science and human rights major. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that was clearly the, the yeah, big shift. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, oh, amazing. And when you said when you came back and you were in Bulgaria, yeah, I think there was a cyclone or um, there was some kind of calamity that that taught you about resilience or that made you that also brought home the kind of essence of yeah. wanting to give back because you saw the kind of destruction it had or you saw what was happening around yeah, you. Yeah, I think it's so. Uh, growing up in Mayurbhanj and Orissa, mm -hmm. and I think for most of us in India, it's really pri privilege is yeah. so palpable. Yeah, and. Um, you know, we have a cocktail of natural disasters we're blessed with in yes. Mayurubhanj and Orissa over other things. Uh, but, you know, uh, Cyclone Phoney happened mm -hmm. and we just kind of, kind of the destruction because of climate. And I think what I felt for, for Mayurubhanj was a lot of the burden of climate is on India and is on some parts of India that may not necessarily have been the ones to uh, kind of spur off that kind of mm -hmm. chain reaction. So, I mean, you're looking at some of you know, especially women and girls are so much more dis dis disadvantaged um, towards climate changes and challenges and they're the ones who have to suffer from it when they're doing the least to mm -hmm. actually, uh, you know, create any of this. Um, so I feel like uh, when I saw a lot of that, I felt my, we needed to kind of have a new branding towards mm -hmm. Mayurubhanj uh, in terms of its identity and how we wanted to speak about ourselves. And I do believe that, you know, innovation and entrepreneurship doesn't just happen in bigger cities like Bombay, Bangalore, Delhi. Mm -hmm. And all of us are, you know, chasing the dream in all these other yeah. cities where we're sitting back home on a pot of gold, and we don't necessarily, uh, because we don't view it in that way, mm. we don't have the language of the words. We're not being able to bring that kind of innovation there. So, uh, I, it was important for me to be able to uh, go outside, talk to more people, and galvanize change. For Phony, it was, uh, you know, bringing volunteers there, sure. trying to make sure we have like raise uh, emergency relief funds, etc. But I think then I started delving deeper into it, you know, and how do you kind of start speaking about like climate, because climate's not, mm. you know, geographically limited. So then how do we start talking about it to a larger national audience and building consensus and making sure that indigenous voices are heard front and sure. center, uh, because they're the ones suffering the worst and mm. on the front lines of this. So how did you do, how did you do that? And it, well, yeah. yeah, and in terms of, you know, when, when you were developing Belgaria, and I know, like you said, you were more active in the external impact yes. that it had. Um, you know, talk to us a little bit about what it's like today and how that's playing out in terms yeah. of sustainable tourism or in terms of empowering the local community. Definitely. And uh, you know, how much you still need to sort of go back and, and sort yeah. of see how things are evolving. So it's definitely a journey. Mm. I think if I had the answer, I would have, like in terms of how do you solve for a lot of that, I think that would have been, made my life much easier. But uh, what's the population like? It's about 20 lakh people. Okay. And it's 80,000 in Baripada, mm. that's the district headquarters. Mm. And it's Urissa's largest district. Okay. Um, and we have, you know, uh, a large part of it is a UNESCO biosphere called Simli Pal, okay. one of Asia's largest biospheres. Mm. So a couple of years ago, um, there was a, like a forest fire, for example. You mentioned the cyclone, but yeah. to be honest, I felt the cyclone was me doing the least that one sure. should do is like be able to have you know, create shelters or, you know, just working in the development space, I could like must, muster something to mm. be able to like, you know, get funds. But I think when Simnipal happened, which was a forest fire, mm. um, and two thirds of Simnipal was on fire. And I, this was like from my house, cause I was living at home. And, you know, you can see smoke from my home. Yeah. And in any other place in the world, if, you know, a building is on fire, you're gonna, there's gonna be a noise created around it. And in my head, I remember thinking on that terrace being like, we are so insignificant to a national, population mm. that this whole place can go up in smoke and not one person will blink their eye because wow. it does not affect them. We don't have uh, mines, we don't have industry and uh, 
we don't even have network in some parts so this is collateral damage That's towards crazy. someone else's yeah. you know so uh, when simply fall happened i did what any millennial could do even in the lead up to that should be something a little more fiery but i tweeted about it <laughs> and i just started to sit tweet rampage and i think i was tagging the chief minister and the tagging the central ministers and i was like and uh, but what exa- what what happened was amazing was uh, people responded and that tweet went viral mm. and uh, the the environment the central minister of environment had to like retweeted my tweet tagging the chief minister worisa saying what's happening in simli park wow and that sort of a chain reaction that's a, that's fantastic i mean uh, that yeah I just tweeted. I always say that like in the end is like it's just one tweet. Yeah, but you know like is. I think if you're like determined and persistent and you can create like we created like a war room in Simlipal where I just I put up a tweet saying if anyone right now can come to Simlipal can help out and talk about it like walk take mm-hmm. a bike take a car we'll host you and we'll feed you. Got it. Um and we got I I made that like you know that tweet for journalists mostly but you know we had so many teenagers who just got on bikes and they took drones out and then like everyone got in on it and there were people and i think for me the fact that there were these students who called saying we've raised this much amount of money what do we do and i was like that's that's Brilliant. amazing because i yeah. think like everyone felt like it was their problem because orissa topped their list of forest fires in the state yeah. with the highest number of forest fires um i think that's when i realized that like real action could be done so we actually made like a draft of a of a memorandum sat with the forest department sat with you know any elected officials mm. um and were like this is what we think needs change mm. spoke to uh, a lot of like um conservation groups being like what needs to be amended in the forest uh, department in structures administrative structures and what does that change look like and then actually got them partnerships within the non-profit space for for helping in conservation anti poaching understanding forest fires and i think a great win for us was actually the department restructuring a little bit i can't take credit for that but at least that the public sort of pressure mounted to that um and uh, we actually were able to develop a lot more infrastructure capabilities within the forest department uh, especially for women and girls mm. uh, because i think some of the women who were you know firefighting are 21 to 25 they yeah. had children they're living in the core area of a forest with no network no signal uh, no weapons on them because they just have you know mm. uh, and they they had they were wearing slippers and fighting a forest fire which was the Simlipal is like you know it's one of the largest biospheres in Asia mm-hmm. so if you can give me a sense so i think that for me was a little bit of like real world of being on ground mm-hmm. having connections and being able to use them whether that's calling up the media or local non-profit groups or just mobilizing mm-hmm. how do you mobilize support for something that can be unheard sure. and go unnoticed uh but on the other side i think i i worked through this i had a full time job i was remote working so i worked for india's first ai non-profit called the wadwani institute for artificial intelligence mm-hmm. So everywhere I've worked I've always tried to make sure that the organization uh gets introduced to the state government of Orissa uh and is able to so we deployed uh you know at the same time we were deploying our first app pest management app to help farmers okay. actually save their crops and uh you know have more uh reap benefits through livelihoods right. uh through AI technologies So I'm interesting is that So like I not not, not connected <laughs> yeah. but I tried to make sure that at least like anywhere I was working the benefit yeah. and the beneficiaries went back to the state of Orissa or at least they were part of the research and development process mm. um I so I think that I, my my bearings have always been a lot to like wherever you are in the world how can you give back home whether that's through uh you know your time value your voice in any way or is it more like you know uh being able to work with the state government or mm. you know schools and building partnerships that might help um yeah. i think the idea is that anything you do should live on longer than that's but that's yeah. just so, so wonderful to hear yeah. that no because really it's it's these are things that have a very long term sustainable impact and you're also touching lives you know bettering the lives of so many people um yeah and i think it's just the beginning it sounds like it's just the beginning yes it definitely yeah. is it definitely is You know you you said something in your TED talk you've done yeah. a, a a TED talk where I found it a very powerful statement in the beginning you said something about shame and about um how we all deal with shame and needing to unlearn yeah. what we've been conditioned yeah. to in terms of the definition of perfection or who we should be yes. uh you know perhaps perhaps you used that quote in a different context you know in the talk but yeah. but I'd love to hear you talk about that because I think that's something that yeah. would resonate with a lot of women out there I think a lot of women go through imposter syndrome. Yeah. And I think uh a lot of the times no matter who you are, you will always walk into a room and go like, mm. am I good enough? Mm. You know, do I speak well enough? Yeah. I think that also being introduced as being a descendant of a royal family puts so much pressure on you because yeah. you're always like 
they're expecting Kate mm. Middleton to walk into the room like with a <laughs> crown and tiaras and a sash and like every move you make is like that's how she drinks water you know like oh my um, god but but that, that that's that's just people's that's curiosity and that's perception and people have a life so I, uh, people have a, you know way of mm-hmm. thinking um, so I think I, I think when I was speaking about shame was also because I I didn't want to be associated with being from the royal family from Mayurbhanj because also there was a certain uh, impression of uh, wealth sure. how you might live uh, to, the, to the clothes you wear to mm-hmm. how you behave and I think it leaves a little room for being a child or being right. carefree or being independent. Um, and sometimes I think being born in that family and, and having that constantly be your one of mm. your identity, your only identity sure. rather, it keeps you in a golden cage because mm. then you're always, you know, you're always going to be in a certain way. So I think that what I tried to do and I think that my parents were really good at that was they always taught us about our history, about our family, about who we were, where we came from. Um, but they didn't restrict us. To for, for that being our only identity, okay. and I think the East is still very different, and in terms of uh, how you know there are, our histories are taught to us than other parts of India. So I think that that allowed us to be entrepreneurs. It allowed us to start and fail in mm. doing that, or you know we were spo- okay. we were athletes growing up, and a- like sports is just such a big part of our lives in terms of it builds that leadership capabilities in you. You fall mm. and you get back up. Sure. So I think that uh, it. In terms of shame, what I think maybe I meant was also having this imposter syndrome of like, who am I? Am I doing enough? You yeah. know, because of course, I mean, when you say you're a descendant of a royal mm. family, you've been given so many privileges. Sure. So how is your district still one of the poorest districts in India? You know, mm. it wasn't your family part of like, you know. So I think a lot of it is like being able to build that muscle to be like, I'm just human. I don't know everything. I'm on this journey. I'd love to take you with me. Mm. Like what I'm asking for is help and support and to be part of this journey of trying to uh, revitalize mm. a lot of different parts of India in ways that might be sustainable to a more, uh, you know, local agrarian yeah. place. Um, I think in terms of identity, what I said was I, there was a way of being successful that was taught mm. to you. You know, mm. you speak English, mm. you, you know, you, if you study abroad, amazing. You've lived and traveled abroad, that's even better. Uh, a way to carry yourself, to sit, to talk and everything. And I don't think that a vision of being successful and being in a big city mm. and you know uh, and the kind of job you have always married into when I thought of myself as like what would I do in my Mayurbhanj like after all of this and I think a lot of people who are not from cities ask themselves that like if I had to go home I'm like, like you yeah. know the worst thing you could possibly do is like go back to your hometown mm. uh, as if you failed in life for mm. some reason to not wanting sure. to be in a certain kind of yeah. you know, rat race or job or have a certain kind of financial or uh, status wealth and so I think that it took me to like, not like anything else I was doing, to go home when the restoration project was being done. And I lived in Mayurbhanj for three years, from about th- almost four years from like 25 mm-hmm. to 29. Uh, and it, it was amazing because I realized I had to relearn my idea of what success meant, what being a successful woman meant. Mm-hmm. Uh, I realized that so much of my idea of being a successful woman, the way I was dressing, the way I was talking, mm-hmm. Uh, the way I wanted to, you know, posture in this world was a lot of like learnings that had like come on to me and like to unlearn that, like I could still wear a sari and sneakers and be like talking about forest fires, you yeah. know, in like a language that not many people are going to understand uh, or, you know, be able to, like I, I, I remember I used to, like, you know, I, I wore like bindi and alta and earrings once and I went somewhere and all the, and I was like, we're from the skilling workshop and digitalization. I'm like, I know, I'm, I was like Swadesh. I was like, right. my one reference is Shah Rukh Khan going back and being like, change the world. Yeah. <laughs> and the women were just like, you know, you look so pretty with Alta on your hands. And I was like, and because they can, you know, so sometimes it's like, you know, why do we have to be, uh, you know, like in our femininity, enjoy leadership and, and learn new languages and, and ways of being mm-hmm. successful and powerful. Uh, rather than it being this one type fit of the kind of job or the city you have it, you know, you know, the language you speak in to be successful. So I think that's kind of what I was alluding to in my TED sure. talk. Yeah. No, I think all of that is, is incredibly relevant, yeah. even for others who are coming from different, um, you know, different spaces. But I think it's relevant to everyone. Yes. Um, what does your role entail now at Dasra? Yeah, so um, the opportunity at Dasra came at a time when I, was, I had worked for three years in, in AI technologies and I realized that the buck stops with funding. Mm-hmm. So how do we speak to people in positions of power in terms of how they would like to be able to build a more sustainable mm-hmm. holistic world? So that was really great because uh, I work with Giving Pie, which is incubated under the nonprofit Dasra. Sure. 
Dustra has been around for close to two decades where they've been able to actually impact uh, over 300 million and catalyze that funding to 600 NGOs in India. Yeah. And uh, Giving Pie is India's first invite-only family philanthropy network. Okay. So we work with families on their philanthropy, how to amplify it, scale it, and mm -hmm. do it very more strategically. Mm -hmm. um, me personally, I look into like lesser known geographies, lesser known thematic mm -hmm. areas of funding. So how to build a case for philanthropy for the arts. Uh, what does, you know, uh, or climate for that matter, uh, or something we're doing recently, uh, our next event is going to be on like skilling mm. and particularly keeping women and girls sure. in mind. Uh, so I think that these are, this is, uh, for me, I try to work nice. with families who, you know, whether that's in the East, whether they're mm. interested in certain thematic areas, and build a larger collaborative ecosystem sure. uh, because so much can happen just putting two people, connecting them and being in touch. Yeah. I think it was also the first job which married very well into what I did in my personal life in any case, sure. building a case and a momentum and uh, invariably uh, having people you know, know more about nonprofits that I think could do with funding or could do with help or mentorship or support. Uh, and at the same time, just building capabilities in the sector. So you're trying to find the next big entrepreneurs. And for me personally, I'm always like, the next Messi is going to come from my yoga sure. today. Um, so how do, do you we... play the sport yourself as well? So I grew up with a number of sports, uh, I think. But uh, uh, horse riding was one that was very close to me. And uh, apart from that, you know, basketball, a number of others. And uh, But I'm... I'm hoping to go this year to uh, Annapurna Base Camp. So I'm hoping that in some way, as I keep growing, you still keep athleticism in your life in some way, and it doesn't have to end with like playing competitive team sports. Uh, but yeah. Sure. So, you know, as you said, there's so much to be done. There's a certain amount of, um, would you say there's a certain apathy in India when it comes to um, everything caring about the things like the climate or yeah. doing good you know for social yes. causes I know that we're talking about it a lot more and of course we have a few families that are you know you know have been very generous philanthropists and everyone highly regards them but overall in terms of actually seeing action on ground and how yeah. much of that would you say is working with the regulators and how much of that really is also about civic sense that's a good question how much working with I I think it's, I don't assume anyone has civic sense okay. anymore. So, wow, okay. <laughs> I think we have to go from there. Mm. Um, but I do think there's a sense of apathy and I think that's, that's, that's across different generations. I mean, we're also growing up in such a hyper-connected world. You know, it's impossible to wake up in the morning, look at the visuals coming out of Gaza, go about mm. your day that, exactly. through the streets yeah. of Bombay where so much of poverty and inequality is just, you know, act constantly thrown at you. Yeah. Uh, and you realize how only how desensitized you are when someone's visiting the city yes. and you know someone yeah. who maybe hasn't been to Asia is like taken aback uh, and then you know till towards the end of the night where you're working with domestic help in your house and you realize that there are so many mm -hmm. levels of you know what are, you know our delivery boys and people sure. you know helping yeah. us make the world what it is but what I've also realized is like people only listen to two things either data or real world stories so actually telling them like numbers it just looks like a statistic to them mm -hmm when I think it's personally a cause that they are, yeah. you know, in, maybe it's happened in their life, maybe something. I think that's when they feel a little more strongly towards the subject. So I, I think that what I've learned to do is not judge someone for where they're sure. in their life yeah. towards what they have empathy for. Mm -hmm. But rather, for example, if someone is in any way being able to raise their voice, uh, make the community yeah. a better space. Uh, for example, I think, to be honest, doing good is good for business. Mm -hmm. You know, it makes more business sense to invest in R&D to make sure that, like, where's the plastic going, where's yeah. the waste going, uh, how many women can you employ, or, you know, so I think, like, just mm -hmm. being able to work with families and people and individuals where they are, yeah. uh, because I think apathy is set in so much to a point, you know, whether it's even the climate, just yeah. knowing that it's not going to get... And we're seeing it's happening around And, us, and also because yeah. I feel like individuals cannot be held as accountable as governments need to hold industry to mm -hmm. account. So I think for a lot of people, you know, um, we're fighting smaller battles saying like don't waste water yeah. but then you're like you can't allow like you know fracking to go on in the level it's going on so I think that there needs to be a little bit of more youth participation in the process sure. what makes me a bit um, it's very hard for me to be cynical but I think what's scary for me is I grew up really wanting to be in politics like I thought this was like aspiration like oh yeah. my god like being you know, uh, uh, being in the civil services, being in politics, being a diplomat, like representing mm. your state, representing, you know, the country, being in, I thought that was, that was like, that was such purposeful, wholesome work. I don't know how many people think being, politi uh, being a politician in India is a wholesome work, as I've realized, you know, like it just fills your heart with joy. So I think that, um, 
India and India is you know just looking at the demographics. Still see you in politics someday. <laughs> you know we need young leaders like yourself, and I feel like we are also seeing many women that are taking that step, like uh, yeah. Naina Motama, for instance, yes. who are choosing to be who they are and at the same time, yeah. you know, do some really great work. I think that one, women just don't have the access to understand how to get into it. I yeah. think the 33%, like, you know, if we, if after a lot, even if it gets passed and actually put into place, I think that is going to encourage, uh, we do need more women to be shown the way by other, you know, other institutions and organizations and through rules coming in actually. Sure. Um, but I, I feel that women need mentors and I think mm -hmm. that what's scary in India right now is that women are dropping out of the workforce at such an alarming rate, uh, you know, educated women. So in, I think like even our neighboring countries have better female participation in the workforce yeah. uh, than India does. And that's really, uh, that for me is an inflection point of the country to look at itself and be sure. like, what is the country not, not doing to allow women the safety of working? You mm. know, like when we're saying that, I think the, what women have realized is if we speak up about something for some reason yeah. our rights get taken away like we go a step back by saying it's you know mm -hmm. crime is increasing you stay at home sure you know like yeah. um, so i feel like that's when women go like forget it you know like the menstrual you know like if people are going to make maternity a problem and yeah. you know menstrual leaves a problem and all this and like we have no problems we just want equal access so i think that's also mm -hmm. wrong because um Women need better mentors, we need better ecosystems to help us, uh, you know, work uh, yeah. laws, etc., to help shape and keep us in the mm -hmm. workforce and not just keep us but make us thrive yeah. in the workforce. Um, but uh, it's I, I, something I do, uh, you know, coming back to your question of like, I think what India needs is also just women in leadership positions, yeah. whether that's Gram Panchayat to, you know, like elect, like municipality heads. To, so I don't even think it needs to be like uh, people in politics and I feel like uh, that's where we'll really start seeing change. Mm -hmm. But of course I'm really lucky because I mean I'm living in the same time with the president of India, so Mayubhanj. And like I like True. I, I think like having yeah. Draupadi Mur I, you know, just like Madam President, like Draupadi Murmuji, like when she came and visited yeah. uh, you know, being able to meet her in Mayurbhanj or uh, I was lucky enough to have met her twice this year and I think that it's just such an inspiring mm -hmm. tale and uh, for me, that was like, wow, like, you know, being a girl from Mayurupanch, like all of us held our head a bit higher because now when someone goes like, wait, where are you from again? And you're like the same place the president is. I have goosebumps. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Yeah. 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 Akshita, thank you so much for joining us. It was so wonderful talking to you today and getting to know you. Yeah. And I'm sure we're going to see a lot more of you in time to come. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to me and uh, it was really lovely to be here and thank you for taking, really, really taking the time. It was really gracious and uh, I very much enjoy speaking with you. Thank you. Thank you.